Would you please come up here? Sarah Maker. Rosalind Russell. Elizabeth Lawton. Okay, this is great. And one more. Loretta Crawford. Come up with a smile. And Joanna. So, why don't you give that to them when they come? Why don't you just come right over here? We, we want to get a picture of everybody, too. There you go. Nice to have you with us. And if you would please turn in your hymnal to number 389 and sing Spirit of the Living God.
Our scripture this morning is John 16, verses 5 through 16. Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. Before we do the prayer, uh, in case you looked in the bulletin at the Lord's Prayer, uh, there was a little typo there. We're just seeing if you're paying attention or not. It's uh, trespasses instead of debts. So uh, when we get to that, we'll use trespasses. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the great healer, so we ask for your healing hand on Edith Renfro, Don and Jan Eichen, Stan Wiebe, Don Tusa, Harold Ulmer, Jade Alvarez, and any others who need your healing touch. Lord, please be with the shut-ins and let them know they are thought of and loved. Also, we pray for the comfort of the family of Shirley Shoemaker, who you brought home to you last week. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to worship you freely here today. Please give comfort and protection for those who are persecuted for believing and trusting in you in the many places where they do not have the same freedom. And dear Lord, we pray for the missionaries across America and throughout the world, especially Nanita Del Mundo in the Philippines with Christian Aid Student Out Mission Outreach. We ask that you bless them all as they work to spread your word. Father God, we also ask for protection for our military men and women around the world. And please give your wisdom and guidance to our government leaders at all levels. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and all of Israel as they are under constant attack by those who wish them destroyed. We thank you for your love for us and for your Holy Spirit who is with us now. And we want honor you in all we do, in Jesus' name. And now join with me in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue our theme speaking on the Holy Spirit this morning, I want to look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine as Christians, as believers, born-again believers. 
the Holy Spirit indwells us and lives within us and wishes to minister to us. And as the time drew near for Jesus to leave and to return back to the Father, he told the apostles, he told those who were disturbed and concerned uh, the, about his departure, he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. But rather, he said, I am going to send you a counselor who will be with you forever. And that counselor, he said, is going to be like me. He came from the Father, he's going to come from the Father, and he's going to be here to minister to you. And I've said to you a, couple, uh, a week or so ago that the word for Holy Spirit is the word paraclete in the Greek. And paraclete uh, is one who comes alongside of you, one to assist you. And in the Jewish New Testament translation of the New Testament by Dr. David Stern, that passage that I just read from you from John 14, 18 reads this way. I will send you a comforting counselor like me, the spirit of truth to be with you forever. Now it's interesting because the word paraclete, and I've mentioned it to you about the one that would come alongside to you, that word, the word like many words or most of our words have at least two meanings based upon how it is used in the sentence. And the word paraclete has two meanings. Again, based upon how it is used in the sentence. And the first one is that of an attorney, as, as someone who's going to come along inside you and speak on your behalf. As an attorney would represent your case in court, so the Holy Spirit is the counselor, the comforter who would come and speak on our behalf. The other picture is that of two ancient warriors standing back to back, defending one another's back, in the midst of a battle. And they are, they are protecting one another. They are shielding one another. And so these two pictures of the Holy Spirit as the one who come alongside of us to speak on our behalf, to indwell us, to teach us, guide us, and direct us, and that of the one who will protect us against our common enemy. The common enemy of our soul is Satan. In fact, the scripture says that he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And those two pictures give us a, a, a volume of information, a volume of understanding of what it is that the Holy Spirit wants to do for us as born again believers. He said that he would be with us and in us, and as the scripture says, he will not only be with us, but he, he will help us remember and he will teach us all things. There are those who have wondered how it is that the, whole, how the, the disciples were able to remember accurately years later when they wrote their Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How was it that they were able to remember all the things and to remember them accurately? Again, the critics of the scriptures say, well, these guys wrote years later, and like us folks in Sun Lakes, their memory was a little weak, and they, they didn't remember things accurately. But the scripture says that he would come and he would not only teach us all things, but he would remind you of everything that I have said to you. That was the promise that Jesus made to his disciples. He said, when I send the comforter, when I send this comforting comforter to you, he will teach you all things and he will remind you of everything that I have said to you. And so we can rely on the scripture because we know that the Holy Spirit when it came to write the scriptures, he refreshed their remember. He, he instilled in their hearts and minds that which God wanted preserved for you and me by means of the written word so that we could know exactly what it is God wants to say to us, what it is he wants us to do to follow him. Now the picture of, of a warrior, of two warriors standing back to back is rather interesting as I said a moment ago. You and I face a spiritual war. Satan is always trying to cause us to doubt, cause us to fear, cause us to question. And in fact, the Holy Spirit said that he would come and intercede on our behalf to the Father. The scripture says that when we do have those moments of doubt and fear and frustration, that it is the Spirit, Paul said in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, who bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When we have those moments of discouragement, we have those moments of doubt, 
And when we finally come to the conclusion, yes, I am a child of God and nothing can separate me from God's love and, and from his relationship, it is the Holy Spirit that bears witness with our spirit, letting us know that we are indeed the children of God. He confirms our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's the comforting spirit, as Dr. Stern said, the comforting counselor that the Lord has provided for us. And then from 1 Corinthians 3, 16, he reminds us that he indwells and he lives in us. Listen to what Paul said to the Corinthians. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Let me read that again. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Now for we in the West, in our Western way of thinking, that's a bit of a strange analogy. But what Paul's, the main Paul point that Paul is trying to make here is that the Holy Spirit is a guest in our lives. He is a guest. He doesn't force himself upon us. He doesn't impose himself upon us. He is a guest in our lives. And his presence not only comforts us, but he counsels us and he defends us. He defends us against the enemy of our soul. Paul also says that the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 16, 8 convicts us of sin. And when I say that, the first thing that came to your mind was, well, I thought the sin issue in our life as Christians was dealt with. Well, yes, our sin nature, yes, our past sin, yes, is dealt with. But on a regular basis, we need to bring Calvary up to date. The scripture says, to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, it is, it is sin. And how often do we know that we should have done something good, we should have followed, we should have obeyed, and we fail to do it? It is the Holy Spirit that brings to our consciousness that we fail to do so, and we need to admit that and ask God's forgiveness. He teaches us the truth of God. How many times, and I've had this said to me so many times through the years, well, I read the Bible, but it doesn't make any sense to me. Well, they've told me a couple of things. They've told me perhaps that they're not a Christian. And if, if you're not a believer, the scripture won't make a lot of sense to you. And the other is that we don't study it. We are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the truth. The Holy Spirit assists us in our prayers. When we want to pray for the salvation of a neighbor, a friend, a loved one, the Holy Spirit will literally ask, help us pray when we don't know how to pray, don't know what to pray for. The Holy Spirit will help us pray. He will empower us in our witness. So oftentimes, we, and some of you in this room perhaps, have said, well, that witnessing and sharing my story, my faith is so difficult, I don't know how. Have you ever asked the Spirit of God to help you, to, to empower you, to illuminate your mind, to give you the right things to say? He will do that if we ask him to do so. And there's one more thing. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 18, he gives us some rather interesting insight into and instructions on how we are to respond to the Spirit. Listen to what Paul wrote to the, to the Ephesians. He said, Do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Let me read that again. Do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, that's an interesting analogy because we all know that if a person is drunk, they are under the influence of whatever beverage they, they consumed. And how often is it that people think that, that, that having the Spirit of God in us is something that we have to do? There's more that we need to do. You know, we need... There, there's something we have to do to gin up. To the contrary, what we really need to do is ask the Holy Spirit to have more of us. Rather than trying to gather more of him into our lives, we need to surrender to him and ask him to have influence in our life. The story of D.L. Moody. Back in the late 1800s, in, in the height of his ministry... Some pastors in Philadelphia asked him to come and hold a citywide evangelistic campaign. And so they invited all of the pastors in Philadelphia to come together and to discuss it and try to get their support for it. And in the course of the meeting, there was a lot of reports of how God was doing mighty things in D.L. Moody's revival services. And finally, one of the more skeptical pastors stood up 
and said sort of sarcastically, and I quote, to hear you talk about it, one would think that D.L. Moody has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. And one of his supporters said, oh, no, 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 no. We, we don't want to intend to, to create that impression at all. But he continued and he said, but I do believe that the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. I do believe that the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. That is a testimony that can be and should be the testimony of every born again believer. Now there's three things that I want to call your attention to from that passage of scripture. That we should be filled with the spirit. And once again, I'm not trying to impress you that I was a Greek scholar. I was not by no stretch of the imagination. But, but Paul says, Don't, do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. He writes that in the imperative mood. For those English majors in our group, the imperative mood, which is the, which is the issuance of a command. So he's commanding, stop being drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. Be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and it is a command, it is not a suggestion. He writes also, be filled with the Spirit in the present tense. And in, in the Greek grammar, that suge suggests a continuous action. Continue not to be drunk on wine, but continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we grow in our walk with Christ, as we mature in Jesus Christ, the key to our growth and our walk is allowing the Holy Spirit to continually have influence in our lives continually to have influence on our lives. And the command is also in the passive mood. And that simply means that being filled with the Spirit is not something that we do, it's something that God does. And so Paul says, don't, don't, be, don't be getting drunk on wine, rather continuously be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's not something that you can do, it's not something you can muster up, but rather it is the continuous influence of the Holy Spirit. It's in the imperative mood. It's a command. It's in the present tense. It's a continuous action. And it's in the passive voice. God does the work, not us. And then there's one final thing that I'd like to call your attention to, and that is this. The scripture repeatedly tells us, urges us, calls upon us not to resist or to grieve the Holy Spirit. Listen to Paul's writing to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let me read it again. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19, Paul says, do not put the Spirit's fire out. Now those are two interesting passages because what they say to us is that God, that the Holy Spirit has wants to, can, will, desires to have influence, positive influence in our lives. But they also reveal that we do have the ability, we do have the ability to hinder God's work in our lives and that we ought not to do so. And you say, well, pastor, how in the world is it that I'm to grieve the Holy Spirit? How can I put the Spirit's fire out in my life? And I'm glad you asked that question because I heard somebody say that. I'm glad you asked that question. We can grieve the Spirit of God by not confessing the sin in our life that I spoke of a moment ago. That grieves the Spirit of God. We can put the fire out of the Spirit of the Lord when we determine to do our will and not God's will. When we know in our heart of hearts what it is God wants us to do. If there's some door we're to walk through, some, some ministry we're to be involved in, something that we are supposed to do, and we decide, I'm not going to do that, it grieves the Holy Spirit. It grieves the Holy Spirit. It grieves the Spirit when we fail to pray. It grieves the Spirit when we fail to study God's Word. When we fail to genuinely worship God, it begins to quench the fire of the Spirit in our lives, and it is a negative influence in our life. And we grieve the Spirit by refusing to share our faith. By refusing to share our faith. It's not a matter that we can't. It's a matter of refusing to do so. We grieve the Holy Spirit. 
Well, last week I began my message by saying to you that in some religious circles, there's a lot of things. The, the Holy Spirit is a is a major subject in, of their of their whole thinking. It, you know, he he. There's a lot said about the Holy Spirit, and in other religious circles, the Holy Spirit is absolutely ignored. And I would hope that you would agree with me that to ignore the Spirit of God and His ministry in our lives is an error. It's an error. I understand that in the years past, we've heard all kinds of stories about, about what people do under the court, the auspices of the Holy Spirit. But those issues are not issues that we ought to be concerned about. What we ought to be concerned about is allowing the comforting comforter of the Holy Spirit influence us as an individual, influence our service, influence our ministry, be under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And he wants very much, he's a guest. He's a guest in our life, and we ought to allow him to do so. We wonder why people are, uh, some people that, you know, they're very busy in the church, they're very busy, act, active, doing things, and they wonder why their lives are, so, are not bearing fruit. It very well be because they do not have the Holy Spirit in their life. They're trying to do everything in their own strength, in their own might. And trust me, we fail when we try to do God's work in our own strength and our own might. He, the comforting Spirit of God, will teach us, He will lead us, He will guide us, He will encourage us if we allow Him to do so. And so I pray, God, that we here at Sun Lakes Community Church will learn how to submit to the Spirit's influence more and more and more. But my dear friends, the only way that will happen is when we as individuals take the time to say, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, mold me, make me, wash me, help me. Invite him to be the guest of our life and then let him be the influence on in our life. And there's no telling what we can see happen here in Sun Lakes and in, as a result of this church. Father, thank you for fulfilling the promise of Jesus. He said, I'm going to go, but I'm going to send the promise of the Father. I'm going to send the Comforter. And he will be with you forever. He will be in you, and he will be with you forever. And you are faithful. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon 120, and they began to share.